So we will start in 10 seconds. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to another EANS webinar. I would like to, my name is Jürgen Beck, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the, of the EANS CSF section. And we have another league webinar today. This one, there is the, I think, the, the real league webinar because Neuroradiology is giving talks today, and there's a very appealing title. How can your neuroradiologist help you? It's all about spinal CSF leaks, and we try to, to give you an update in diagnosis and management. Unfortunately, Mansur Farugi, who initiated this webinar, he is right now in the OR. He has to handle a surgical emergency, but probably he will join us later for the webinar. And um, as always with the ENS webinars, please feel free to join the discussion. We have a Q&A box and you can always enter your question and we try to, I try to read the questions to the lecturers and then we um, hopefully will have a lovely discussion about your questions. So we have three very excellent speakers, all um, trained and specialized neuroradiologists and all experts on, on spinal CSF leaks. And we divided it into three sections, each uh, almost 20 minutes talk, and then we have plenty of time for discussions. And we start with the uh, basics, diagnosis, basics and beyond of SIH pearls and pitfalls for the neurosurgeon to know. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Daniel Scoffings, who um, uh, joins us from Edinburgh's hospital in Cambridge. I know him for a very long time and uh, we discussed many cases together and uh, he's really uh, an expert in, in SIH and spinal leaks. And so for now, this is my introduction. And Daniel, please, the stage is yours. And again, to the audience, please type in your questions in the Q&A box and enjoy the webinar. Daniel. Jürgen, thank you very much. That lovely introduction. And thank you to Mansour as well for organizing this. So yeah, I'm a neuroradiologist in Cambridge and I'll be talking to you about the basics for the next 20 minutes. Then my two excellent colleagues will uh, up the ante a bit and tell you the really expert stuff. Um, so I think my colleagues probably think that I'm a bit like this. Um, you know, I'm always talking about CSF leaks, but I think there's a perception that CSF leaks from the spine are, are rare, but really once you know what you're looking for, you find that they're everywhere. You see them all the time. It's certainly not as rare as a lot of people seem to think. And, and as neurosurgeons, you will see these patients quite often. They present you in many different ways. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can recognize them and the circumstances where you should be thinking about this diagnosis. So what we're going to cover is um, the basics of SIH, that is, what causes it, when should you suspect it, and what is the role of non-invasive imaging, principally really with MRI. Talk about the, the typical appearances of the brain with SIH, uh, and then some of the more uncommon or less well-known manifestations that you might see as well, and some traps for the unwary, those, those areas where some caution is really needed. And then towards the end, we'll consider the role of spine MRI in the workup of SIH, and how it can help with decision making, which will lead on to the second of our talk by Dr. Carlton Jones about leak uh, localization with myelography. So SIH is a it's a clinical syndrome secondary to CSF volume depletion, which occurs as the result of a spinal spontaneous spinal CSF leak. So it's clinically similar to, but it's distinct from post surgical leakage of CSF or the phenomenon of post dural puncture headache. And really, SIH, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, is a bit of a misnomer. Many of these patients have CSF pressure that's actually in the normal range, or sometimes even high. Fewer than a third will actually have low pressure when you measure it. And as I've alluded to, it's a lot of people will consider this to be a rare diagnosis. But a couple of recent epidemiological studies from the um, United States have found an incidence very similar in both studies of around four per 100,000 per year. And when you compare that to something that we don't think is rare, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is eight per 100,000 per year, it's really not that different. So really SIH is not anywhere near as rare as we think it probably is. And part of this means that this is a, a condition which is under-recognized. Um, it's also under-investigated and sometimes under-treated. And this leads to miserable uh, time and, and outcomes for patients who wait a long time to, to get diagnosed and treated. So 
the presentation of these patients is a whole range of symptoms. Um, and these are some of the most common ones in descending order of frequency. The, the most common, the classic one, is with an orthostatic headache. Headache that's worse when you sit up and better when you lie down. And that's the thing that everyone thinks about. But it's important to know that the longer your condition goes on, this orthostatic quality can become blunted or even absent. Some people will just have a valsalva headache or a second half of day headache. Nausea and vomiting are pretty common in this condition. And so is a sensation of pain in the neck or so occiput and neck stiffness. And a surprising number of patients will also complain of auditory symptoms of tinnitus or muffled hearing and dizziness. And then less frequently, not listed here, but you may see patients presenting with a cognitive manifestation with a frontotemporal dementia-like presentation or even with movement disorders. So what causes this? Well, we'll see this picture again, but there are three broad types of uh, spontaneous spinal CSF leak, um, ventral dural tears, lateral leaks, and CSF to venous fistulas. So first of all, ventral dural tears. These occur as a result of little osteophytic spurs or um, little bits of calcified disc that pierce the dura like a knife, allowing CSF to leak out. These most often occur in the upper thoracic spine, um, and they're more commonly seen in younger patients who more often, compared to other patients with spontaneous leaks, have a normal BMI. As we've said, because it's a piercing of the dura, you see epidural fluid. Lateral leaks uh, occur either as a result of a nerve root sleeve tear, or you can get, as in this case, a tear in the axillary region of the dura, allowing arachnoid to herniate out, and then CSF can seep from the edge of that, or these can even rupture. And again, this will usually be associated with epidural fluid because there's a dural defect. And these are slightly more common in the lower part of the thoracic spine, but can occur anywhere. And then lastly, increasingly recognized and increasingly detected now are CSF to venous fistulas. These are an abnormal communication between CSF in the theca or around a nerve root sleeve and adjacent epidural veins. These are more common in the older patient cohort and those who have a higher BMI. And part of this may be because there's a putative link that some of these leaks may occur in patients who have pre-existing high pressure idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and they get rupture of arachnoid granulations in the spine, allowing CSF to leak into adjacent veins. These are not associated with epidural pooling of fluid because the fluid is leaking directly into veins, allowing unregulated loss of CSF. And these types of leaks are more common, they can occur anywhere, but they're more common in the lower thoracic spine and they're more common on the right side of the spine than on the left. An important thing to remember, and one that's often misunderstood, is that this clinical syndrome of SIH and the, these MRI appearances that we see, and we're going to come onto those shortly, these don't occur as a result of CSF rhinorrhea or otorrhea. You know, if you see brain findings of SIH, then we need to be looking in the spine for the leak. The leak is not going to be coming from the skull vein. So what's, the, what's our role as neuroradiologists? What's the purpose of imaging? Well, firstly, it's to help establish the diagnosis of SIH by showing positive signs of CSF volume depletion, primarily on brain MRI, but you may also see them on spine imaging. We can use scoring systems for brain MRI, which can help us stratify patients into how likely it is that we may see a leak at myelography. And then with spine MRI, what we're trying to do is try and predict the type of leak, one of those three types that a patient is likely to have. And this can help us to select an appropriate myelographic strategy, which is going to be covered in more detail in the second of our talks. So the underlying um, pathophysiology of the appearances that we see on MRI can be explained primarily by a reference to the Monroe-Kelly doctrine, which as we all remember, you have a fixed volume of skull and a fixed volume of brain tissue, and then a variable volume of blood and CSF intracranially. So when you have leakage of CSF and intracranial CSF and spinal CSF volume depletion, because your skull is fixed and the brain tissue are fixed, loss of CSF is compensated for by an increase in intracranial blood volume. And that's what leads to the appearances that we see. And the most widely known and best recognized of these is diffuse pachymeningeal or dural thickening, best seen on T1-weighted imaging with smooth concentric, smooth thickening of the dura over the cerebral convexities, but also often seen in the posterior fossa and very often going into the internal auditory canals and even from the back of the clivus down into the spine. And this occurs as a result of vascular congestion of the meninges from the increased blood volume. Now this smooth dural thickening is in contrast to the nodular, irregular thickening that we see in patients with inflammatory 
um, hypertrophic bacteria meningitis or infective or neoplastic uh, meningitides. As we said, this is best seen on T1 weighted imaging, this sequence on the left here, but you can see it very well on a flare sequence. And a lot of patients will have initially been investigated without contrast. Um, and you will still be able to see dural thickening on a flare sequence, even without contrast. And so it's not necessary in those instances to recall the patient just for contrast. But when we're doing the scanning primarily, we would include contrast in the protocol, um, but it's not absolutely essential. So I would never recall someone just to give contrast if I'd seen an appearance like this. I would be happy that this was dural thickening. Another important thing is that this dural thickening has a time dependent appearance and it can decrease over time. So this is a patient at presentation and then who neglect, uh, not, or not neglected, they declined to have any treatment of any kind. And then at one year follow up, their symptoms had improved and their dural thickening has also resolved. But this appearance can also be seen in patients who remain symptomatic. The dural thickening can diminish over time. And so it's important to remember that patients who've been symptomatic for a long time, you might not see dural thickening because you're scanning them late. And if we'd scanned them earlier in their disease process, we may have seen this appearance. So the next common finding that we see in patients with spontaneous spinal CSF leaks is subdural fluid collections. And these are usually, but not always, bilateral. They can occur unilateral, but, uh, unilaterally, but typically they're bilateral, overlying the cerebral convexities, and they range in size from these thin film-like subdurals to larger hygromas or even frank hematomas with mass effect. And in, in an individual patient, they can progress from one to the next. So this is a patient who started with fairly thin uh, subdural effusions, which then got a bit of blood in them. You can see a blood fluid level here as a bit of bleeding has occurred. And then this has undergone significant expansion. And this is one of the common ways in which SIH presents to neurosurgeons. Patients with atraumatic subdural hemorrhage, we should be thinking about the possibility of a spinal CSF leak. Because if we don't, and these patients undergo drainage, then they're at increased risk uh, because the cause of the subdural hasn't been addressed, that their subdurals may reaccumulate or they may undergo progressive brain sag and herniation with deleterious consequences and neurological deterioration. So this is one example of a patient whose um, subdural, they've got an acute subdural over this convexity with high attenuation blood. There's also a very thin low density subdural over the right convexity. And this wasn't initially recognized uh, they underwent burr hole drainage and then they deteriorated. And on this uh, example that's been sent in to us by one of my colleagues, you can see um, that there's hemorrhage within the ponds. And on the MRI, again, you can see there's really bad brain sag. There's this linear, it's like a durette type hemorrhage, but it's caused by the brain sagging down rather than being pushed down. And on the axial, it's distortion of the midbrain caused by sagging and the third ventricle has been pushed right down and there's been reaccumulation of subdural fluid. So we need to think about this. How can, we, how can we avoid this? How can we tell if someone's got subdurals? Could it be due to SIH? Well, something that's a common theme in this talk is look for the other signs of SIH. So look for dural enhancement, look for the other findings that we're gonna talk about, but also look at where the dural enhancement occurs. Look for impotentorial collections and look for disproportionate displacement of the brainstem to the size of the collection. So, Subdurals of any cause, whether it's SIH or trauma, it's normal to see some dural enhancements at the margins. This is a patient with SIH, bilateral subdurals, and enhancement next to the subdurals. This is a traumatic hygroma, and there's dural enhancement at the margin of it, but there's no enhancement on the opposite side. So there's not diffuse enhancement, it's just next to, to the subdural. And then again, in SIH, we'll see quite commonly posterior fossa dural enhancement and enhancement over the temporal poles away from where the collections are. And in trauma or other causes, you don't see this. So in SIH, the dural enhancement doesn't only occur next to the subdural. So look for widespread enhancement, not just enhancement next to the collection. As I've mentioned, infratentorial collections are quite common in SIH and they're not that common with trauma. So when I see someone who's got bilateral subdural collections and there's also fluid under the tent, then I'm raising the spectre of SIH as the cause. And then lastly, really important to look at sagittal reformats of patients who come in with acute subdurals and no history of trauma. You're looking for brainstem sagging, which we're going to talk about in a moment, that's displacement of the brain cordially that's disproportionate to the size of the collection because the brain's being sucked or pulled down by the leak and then they're developing subdurals. It's not that the brain's being pushed down.
So venous distension is a very dynamic finding. It's one of the first to appear when someone gets a leak, they get an increase in blood volume. And when the leak is successfully treated, it's one of the first to disappear. One of the best ways to look for this is on the dominant transverse sinus in its midsection on a sagittal MRI. Now, normally, the lower border of that uh, transverse sinus is either flat or upwardly concave. And in SIH, it bulges downwards like this. But you can also see venous distension in other sinuses. So here, quite often, we'll see a rounded cross-sectional profile of the posterior part of the superior sagittal sinus just above the torcular. And on the same slides, you can see lateral bowing of the margins of the straight sinus, which normally they bow in a bit. And quite commonly in these patients, we'll just see real distension of the straight sinus. Enlargement of the pituitary is another way that these patients will present neurosurgically. We see a few of these in our pituitary multidisciplinary team meeting each year. Um, you get engorgement of the pituitary because of venous congestion. Um, they can get mild hyperprolactinemia because of a stalk effect. And so that can also lead to confusion with um, an adenoma or in some patients with hypophysitis. This is a finding that's easier to recognize in men and older patients because they tend to have a smaller pituitary. In young women of childbearing age and whom the pituitary is normally relatively prominent, it can be quite difficult to spot this. But again, the key to not mistaking pituitary enlargement from SIH to that from other causes is to look for the other findings. So in this case, there's this diffuse smooth, there's the same patient, diffuse smooth dural thickening over the convexities. Isolated enlargement of the pituitary is the only finding in SIH is incredibly rare. And I don't know that I've ever seen it. So you will always see other findings as well. It's not just an enlarged pituitary on its own. Now, sagging of the brain uh, can vary in severity from relatively mild to really quite marked. And there are a number of different ways you can assess this. I tend to just eyeball it most of the time. There are measurements you can make. There are angles you can measure. They can be helpful in tricky cases, but most of the time, it's fairly obvious that the brain looks saggy and really the measurements are reserved for the, for the really mild cases. But findings what I'm looking for are narrowing of the supracellar cistern, get reduction in the difference, the distance rather, between the mammillary bodies and the pons. So the mammillopontine distance is narrowed and it's progressively narrowed in these cases of worsening severity. The pons becomes rubbed up and flattened. The belly of the pons is flattened up against the clivus, narrowing the prepontine cistern. And in some cases, we'll see tonsillar descent, which can lead to some diagnostic confusion as we're going to come on to. Now, the ITA is the opening of the cerebral aqueduct. And normally it lies above the plane of the incisura, which is usually on a line from the back of the, the dorsum celli up to the confluence of the vein of Galen and the straight sinus. So this approximates the plane of the tentorial incisura. And with brain sag, the ITA is displaced cordially below that. So, Brain sagging is a mimic of a Chiari-1 malformation, and it's not uncommon to see um, cases of SIH misdiagnosed as this. And this can lead to inappropriate treatment with frame and magnum decompression, um, which is unlikely to be beneficial for these patients. So these are two patients um, who've got SIH who have undergone um, frame and magnum decompressions. So how can we distinguish this? Again, recurring theme, look for the other signs of SIH. But also, as I've mentioned, look at the position of the ITA. If it's below the incisural plane, that's not a feature of QRL malformation. That indicates brain sag. Look for the slope of the floor of the third ventricle. Normally, the third ventricular floor will slope upwards from the chiasm to the, um, to the ITA. In SIH, that becomes progressively horizontal or even downwards. And then you can also look at narrowing of the angle between the anterior surface of the midbrain and the top of the pons, so-called ponto mesencephalic angle. So if we return to these cases, Again, we see this is the patient with SIH who also has a big pituitary, venous distension. They've got narrowing of this angle between the pons and the midbrain. Their in superior surface of the midbrain is indistinct, which is another feature of brain sag, and the floor to third ventricle is sloping downwards. In this patient who's got a Chiari 1, none of those findings are present. And importantly, isolated tonsillar descent doesn't occur in SIH. So if the only finding you've got is low tonsils with none of the other features, then it's not gonna be SIH. Now, all of these findings we've discussed have been synthesized by um, Professor Beck and his colleagues into something that's now become known as the burn score, which ranges from zero to nine. And there are six criteria, three major worth two points and three minor worth one point. And if you top these up, these various measurements and qualitative findings, this gives you a score, again, ranging from zero to nine, which stratifies patients into low, 
intermediate and high probability of how likely it is that you'll see a CSF leak if you do a myelogram. And you will still find CSF leaks in patients with a score of zero, but it's just much less likely. In some patients with a score of nine, it's really hard to find the leak, but this just gives you some indication of how likely it is that you're going to see something. Um, this is also can be useful as a semi-quantitative assessment of treatment response. Other findings you um, may see, which are not that well uh, recognized or described. One is optic nerve sheath collapse. So this is the patient with SIH. This is a normal patient where it's normal to see a little bit of fluid around the optic nerves. With SIH, that gets lost. And so you just see no fluid around the optic nerves at all. More recently described is this uh, phenomenon of what's been called layer cake skull, which is diffuse laying down of a new layer of bone on the inner table of the skull, producing this layered appearance. And you can see this on CT and on MRI as well. So this layered appearance of concentric calvarial hyperostosis um, is a feature of a chronic CSF leak. It's also been seen in patients who are chronically shunted as well. And this occurs in around 18% uh, of patients with SIH. And then another a finding that's really important to look for, which you should look for in patients with leaks, and if you see it, you should look for a leak, is infratentorial superficial siderosis. So laying down a beam of siderin on the surface of the cerebellum and the brainstem. You can sometimes see it on T2-weighted imaging. It's much more obvious if you do susceptibility-weighted sequences like SWI. Um, and this occurs when you've got a dural defect and a chronic spinal CSF leak. You have friable blood vessels at the margin, and these just ooze blood over time. And patients who have chronic leaks, they may have no headache, but they're at risk of developing this, and this can lead to ataxia and deafness 15, 20 years down the line. So it's an important finding to look for. So why do we do spine imaging? These patients have spinal CSF leaks. It's important to know why we're doing this and what it can, what it can't achieve. The main reason to do spine MRI is not to diagnose SIH. That's the role of brain MRI, but you might see some findings that support the diagnosis. It's not to try and localize the leak, but as uh, Lau will show you, you can sometimes see where the leak is coming from on an MRI, but you shouldn't rely on MRI for this. It's really a bonus piece of information. The main role is to try and categorize what type of leak a patient has. Is it a dural tear? Is it likely to be a CSF venous fistula? And in doing so, this helps us work out, but based on what type of leak they may have, what's gonna be the best way to look for it with myelography, which is what talk two will be about. So, the spinal findings of MRI of, of SIH that you may see on spine MRI, you can, as in the brain, see dural thickening and enhancement. And you can see venous dilatation. So these are the epidural veins. These are abnormally prominent because the patient has a leak. And sometimes you can even see dilatation of subarachnoid veins. And this can mimic the appearances of a, of a dural AV fistula. So you might see some of these findings, but these are just bits of bonus information. Something that we should be aware of and not fall into the trap of is what's in terms of C12 false localizing sign. And what this is, is high signal from fluid, so best seen on T2 weighted imaging with fat suppression, so it's sensitive to fluid in the interspace between C1 and C2 and in the adjacent paraspinal muscles. This is not where the leak's coming from. This is a patient who has an epidural leakage of fluid and that fluid tracks up and then it's just coming out at this level, but this isn't where the leak comes from. So it's important if you see this, doesn't mean they're leaking from the cervical spine. The leak is usually in the thoracic spine. The key finding, the thing we're looking for in order to determine what type of leak someone has is this thing called a spinal longitudinal epidural collection, sometimes abbreviated in the literature to SLEC. And this is epidural... ...during fat suppression, so you can distinguish it from the surrounding... Um, epidural fat. So this is the spinal cord, here's CSF, here's the black line of the seeker, this is it. Daniel, can you, can you hear me? Bear with me a second. Obviously you just I've fallen out of your presentation. Apologies. Yeah, I'm just coming back. I apologize for everyone. It's, it's trying to make me show you my notes. Just bear with me a second. Okay, am I back? Yeah. We're good to go. I'm very sorry, everybody. Let me just... Uh... Okay, so when you see an epidural fluid collection, it means there's a dural defect, and that fluid is leaking out into the epidural space. 
Now, there's absolutely no reliable relationship between where the SLEC is, how long it is, and where the leak is. This was from early work on digital subtraction myelography, and this just shows the craniochordal extent as gray lines of these SLECs, and the black dots are where the actual leak was. Sometimes it's in the middle, sometimes it's at the bottom, sometimes it's at the top. So really, if you see a SLEC, you know you're looking for a defect, but you don't know where it's going to be in relation to that collection. Axial location can give you some clues, and this is something that Lau's going to talk about. But early on with acute leaks, you often get circumferential fluid. You don't really know where it's coming from. With time, the collection can become more organized. If the collection is anterior to the cord, it means the defect's almost certainly on the front of the, of the dura, usually from one of those discogenic microspurs, the so-called type 1. If the fluid is mainly dorsal, then that is more commonly associated with a nerve root sleeve tear, but this is something that we'll be covered in a bit more detail in the second talk, so I'm not going to dwell on it. If you don't see any epidural fluid and the patient's got SIH, then they've most likely got a CSF to venous fistula. And in that circumstance, one of the things I'm looking for are meningeal diverticular. Now, these are a common incidental finding in patients that don't have leaks. They occur in at least 5% of spine MRIs. But in the setting of SIH, they assume more importance because CSF to venous fistulas occur in association with these diverticular in around 80% of cases. Sometimes the fistulas come straight off the theca without a fistula, uh, without a, a diverticulum, but most of the time there'll be a diverticulum. The thing is, with MRI, you've got no idea which one of these diverticular has a CVF associated with it. You can't tell which side or which level. But if you see these, it means that you're looking for a CSF venous fistula in the absence of any epidural fluid. And then there's the problem of patients who have normal imaging, which is around one in five patients that we know have got a spinal CSF leak, have normal brain MRI, normal spine MRI. This is more common the longer that the um, patient is symptomatic. As we've seen, some of those findings can disappear over time. So when the brain MRI is completely properly normal, and we need to make sure it's properly normal because some of the findings, especially subtle brain sag, can be really quite minimal and difficult to detect. But if you've got a properly normal brain MRI, then the spine MRI becomes even more important because if you've got those diverticular and they've got a good clinical syndrome, then we're looking for a CSF venous fistula. If the brain MRI is completely normal and the spine MRI is completely normal, then they may still have a leak, but the chance of being able to find it uh, or, the, or the likelihood rather at, at myelography is definitely substantially less. So the key messages from this talk are that neurosurgical presentations of SIH are not at all uncommon and they'll come to you as traumat atraumatic subdurals. They can masquerade as QRE1 malformations and they can mimic pituitary tumors. The really important thing is to just keep this diagnosis in the back of your mind and remember to think about it. Look for those findings on brain MRI that support the diagnosis. Look for the subtle epidural collection on the spine MRI. Whilst many patients will have really floridly abnormal brain MRIs, but in scores of nine, you know, remember not all of the findings are going to be present in every patient, even with the same kind of leak, and not present to the same degree of severity. And remember that up to a fifth of patients with a spinal leak will have a normal MRI, and that the longer the patient has been symptomatic for, the more likely this is to be the case. And as we're going to hear in the next talk, the main reason that we do spine MRI in SIH is to see if there's epidural fluid, which is evidence of a dural tear, uh, or, or whether there's no epidural fluid, meaning that we're looking for a, a venous fistula. And Dr. Carlton Jones will show some examples of where you can see the leak site on an MRI, but generally speaking, these are the exception and a, and a bonus treat rather than the rule. So apologies for the technical problems. Thank you uh, for your attention, and I will uh, stop talking now. Daniel, thank you very much. This was just brilliant. Um, you really, you, you, you brought the point and um, very important messages. And um, I'll ask the audience whether there are any questions up to now. And I'll check the Q&A box. There are no questions up to now. So please insert your questions into the Q&A box. And um, so probably Daniel, until Lalani will set up her talk, what it was just a curious question. What was your number one differential diagnosis, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, where SIH was not so ubiquitous in our minds? Um, what is the, what a, what, or even now, what is the number one differential diagnosis if you look at a brain MRI suspicious for SIH? Yeah, 
um, as in what do, what do other people think? I mean, I'm always looking for my, my, my number one differential diagnosis is always SIH because I'm thinking about it all the time. Um, I think a lot of the patients that we that I see come to the neurosurgeons and they get referred with spontaneous bilateral, you know, tron, spontaneous subdurals. And the surgeons are very keen, certainly in my institution, to be looking for a vascular malformation or a dural AV fistula as a cause of this. And I, I can't remember a case where I've seen that um, be the case. And I think we're coming round to the view now that you know a lot of these patients have spinal CSF leaks. Um, in terms of, I think a lot of these patients get labelled as having some kind of hypertrophic pachymeningitis because of their dural thickening, or sometimes patients have the misfortune to be a patient with a previous history of malignancy, and then they just develop SIH, and they get told they've got malignant meningitis. You know, there's all kinds of differentials get suggested for this. I've definitely seen early on in my career a patient who had very bad brain sag before I really knew much about SIH, and I think we attributed that to a congenital um, midbrain um pontomesencephalic uh, junction dysplasia. So these things get mislabeled as all kinds of things, and I've definitely done it myself in the past. These days, I'm probably um, you know, much more keyed into looking for SIH and uh, maybe overdiagnose it sometimes. Okay, thanks. So now we have some questions. And um, one question from Mamdou Saleh. What is the difference between a Tarlov cyst and a dural diverticulum? Oh, that's a good question, and I'm not 100% sure that I know the answer. I think that the literature is a bit um, um, full of these, these change, terms get used interchangeably. I did find a very old paper from the 1970s by Tarlov where there was a, there's a beautiful diagram. I didn't have time to include it, but where it, it depends on meningeal diverticulum versus a Tarlov cyst, depends on um, how much of the dura goes around it. So I think you can have a, you can have a dural defect, and then arachnoid herniates out through that. And I think that's come from some work that you've done with your group. But you can also have an intact dural covering, which is a, a true diverticulum rather than a, um, a, a perineural cyst in that sense. I'm not sure how well these things have been studied histologically um, mm. in contemporary practice. So the patients who have these, um, you know, CSF venous fissures, I think only a few of them have been subjected to histopathological analysis. Um, I don't know, maybe, do you have any insights on that, Jürgen? Sorry to turn the question back on the moderator. Uh, I think so too. This is not very well defined. Probably location is another hint or clue. Talofsis mm -hmm. are usually considered to be in the sacral region and the uh, diverticular we are talking about in SIH are more prominent or more dominant or mm -hmm. more often in the thoracic spine, as you have nicely shown. But um, I'm quite sure there is no clear cut uh, overall agreed definition, what is the difference between a Talov cyst and a diverticulum? This is a good question, and I'm mm. asking this question myself always, but it's very, it's, I think it's important to not to treat the sacral, more lateral um, cysts, which are, I think, Talov cysts as the cause of SIH, and to, to jump on these Talov cysts and uh, oversee the real leak at the thoracic spine. Mm. Yeah. No. Well, we mean, see, you know, we we often I'm, a lot of us will see Tarlov cysts commonly, but I've I've not, in, certainly in my experience, seen any leak from a Tarlov cyst as such. You know, when we have duralectasia and, and and cysts associated with that in the sacral spine, that's different, and we have seen leaks from those, but not. And you know, your group has obviously done work on that, but Tarlov cysts per se, I haven't seen leaks from those specifically. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um. I just read another question from Farouk Zulfikar. Sometimes CSF leak is suspected with the findings of tonsil herniation with postural headache. Unfortunately, these patients already had foramen magnum decompression with false diagnosis of Chiari 1. How to prevent this pitfall? I think this was nicely depicted by you, Daniel. Probably you can just point to the to the big big issues again, how to differentiate Chiari from a leak? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a very common theme across everything that we've said with the differentials is to just look for the other, you need to know what the findings of SIH are and look for those findings as well. Look for enlarged pituitaries, enlarged veins. And in SIH, you get this distort, because the low tonsils are caused by sagging of the brain, you see those other features. So you'll see lowering of the floor of the third ventricle, or it becomes indistinct narrowing of the prepontine system, the, the superior opening of the aqueduct, the ITER, becomes inferiorly displaced. And as I've mentioned, the, the really useful thing, there was a really nice paper by Peter Crowns and colleagues in Duke, where they published this in J Neurosurge, um, looking at differentiating SIH from 
uh, with tonsillar ectopia from Chiari ones and in that in that cohort none of the patients that had SAH only had low tonsils they always had anatomical distortion of the midbrain as well but that's not a, a feature of Chiari one itself. I think the other thing to maybe add there is also, you know, obviously after the fact, you know, it might, you know, they, they say they've had their decompression, it, you know, you're not too late. You're, you're obviously too late in that, you know, you've done the decompression, but, you know, don't leave the patient, examine the spine. If you think that they've got SIH, you, you've got to go on and examine the spine, MR and myelography as required. Absolutely. And we have a very relevant question, another relevant question for daily practice from Ankash Dukun, most patients with bilateral non-traumatic chronic subdural hemorrhage present acutely and are diagnosed on CT scan. Would you therefore recommend an MRI in all those cases? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, well, I mean, as I've mentioned, and this is something I picked up from Lyle's uh, talk that she gave in, in Naples about this topic, but using the sagittal reformats, of head CT. You can, I mean, MRI is the best test for looking for all of those findings that we've discussed, but you can pick up some of them on CT as well. So you can identify enlargement of the pituitary. You can see distension of the venous sinuses, even without contrast. And you definitely can see anatomical distortion of the midbrain and narrowing of the prepontine system. You don't see it as nicely, but you can see it. Um, so there, you know, there's some free information on that CT. It's obviously not practical to get um, MRIs in all of those cases, but I don't know, Lau, do you have anything extra to say about that? Yeah, actually, uh, we, we look on subtle signs on CT, mm. but in doubt, we go for an MRI. Yeah, oh yeah, and, definitely. And, and we even, I think you nicely pointed out that the brain MRI is usually the first step to diagnose SIH. If mm. we have bilateral chronic to subdural hematomas in a younger patient, we, I think we, as you said, in I always see CSF leaks, we really continue the workup until we excluded a leak. And in these patients, we usually add a spinal MRI as well to look for, for slags or for diverticula or other subtle signs of a CSF leak. So yes, go for and look for a leak in, in these steps. Reformat your CT, do a brain MRI, and then add a spinal MRI. Dalani, do you agree? Yeah, I do. And I would also say that, you know, obviously Dan's showed cases where, you know, you have a lot of the imaging sign findings. Look, some cases are difficult. You don't have necessarily all the findings. If the clinical history is good, there's no history of trauma. It's exactly as Jürgen said, don't, you know, leave the patient. You know, you've, you you may have to do like more workup, spine, myelography, even if you think that um, there's a good chance that they're going to have an underlying CSF leak. And I'm even more aggressive. If a young patient has bilateral chronics and you keep on asking, didn't you have a trauma, even a mild trauma? They always say, ah, yes, probably eight weeks ago I hit my head. So if you have bilateral chronic subdurals, um, probably you need to rule out any subtle signs of SIH. And if there are any signs, go on at brain MRI and at spine MRI. Okay, yeah. excellent yeah. questions, really excellent questions. Excellent discussion. And you will have plenty of room and time to ask further questions. So please take in your questions in the Q&A box. And now I'm very happy to introduce Lalani, Dr. Lalani Powton jones who is really um, a specialist in, in um, SIH. And we um, have a long history together, uh, gave talks on, on, this, on identical meetings and even treat and discuss patients together. And I'm always very happy if I'm lucky enough to get your opinion on a difficult case, Lalani. So I'm looking forward to your talk now. And um, the second talk is now about diagnosing the, the, the leak localizations, um, updates in myelography, and generally speaking, advanced imaging for leak localization. Lalani, please. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Jürgen, for the kind introduction. And thanks so much to the ANS section for allowing neuroradiologists to be part of your program. Um, you know, multidisciplinary management of, of CSF leaks is really what um, benefits the patient. And, you know, having a strong relationship between neuroradiologists and neurosurgeons is, is, is really important um, for most things, but particularly in this disorder. So Dan's really covered, you know, how do you diagnose SIH? Have you got, so you've made this diagnosis that the patient has a spinal CSF leak. So what do you do then? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 
how you go on to localize a leak. But why do you need to even do that? Well, the main thing is, is that if you want to target your treatment for this patient, you need to have a precise leak, lo leak localization. If you don't, then there's a risk that you, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, my screen was uh, fading on me. If, if you don't have an accurate leak localization, if you get the wrong level, then the treatment, whether it's radiologically guided or surgical, will be much less likely to be effective. So what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to look at the utility of spine MRI. And Dan has talked a little bit about this, um, but I'll go over on what I think some of the most important points are. Then I'm going to look at the fundamental principles of choosing how to do what myelogram we do and the basics of these myelographic techniques, give you some examples of, of cases, and then what happens once the myelogram is done, whether it's positive or negative. So Dan has mentioned this um, a little bit, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this, but he, I just want to reiterate this point. Spine MRI is not to diagnose SIH, that's what your brain MRI is for, and it's not really to locate the leak either. And the reason I reiterate this is we often have requests from neurosurgeons saying, tell me where the level of the leak is. And your spine MRI is, is not really going to do that, it's, it's rarely going to do that. So I want you to just understand what spine MRI really is for. But having said that it doesn't locate levels of the leak, sometimes you can see dural defects. And for example, in this case, when you have high resolution, thin section, heavily T2 weighted sequences, which we always add in, such as a 3D cyst or a Fiesta, sometimes you can actually get an idea of the actual defect itself. And this can be helpful when it comes to myelography because it can keep your radiation dose down by decreasing what you're actually covering. So in this patient, you can see here the, the dura and you can see that there's epidural fluid outside of it. You see this big disc protrusion, which is uh, entering through the theca. And you can see just above it, you can see that there is this midline, just paramedian defect in the dura ventrally. Here was a patient who had a long history of SIH, and he came to us having had a motorcycle accident 17 years prior. And what you see here is a sort of very typical appearances of a nerve root sleeve avulsion. Here you can see that there's epidural fluid. It's mainly at the front, but also around at the side. And you can see big gaps in where these nerve root sleeve avulsions have occurred. Here again, another midline defect. Now, often you will see small discs herniations and osteophytic spurs as common incidental findings in patients without CSF leaks. But they're also associated with ventral leaks, as Dan pointed out. So in the presence of epidural fluid, it's worth scrutinizing them a bit more closely because you may be able to see a causative lesion if you see the spike of the disc protruding through the dura itself, as for example, in this case. But they're common, so don't rely on them. And then we've noticed also that sometimes CSF pulsation artifact can give you a clue. This patient here, you can see they had a big epidural fluid collection that's mainly at the front. So ventrally, we know there's going to be a ventral dural defect. You can see she's got clear findings of SIH, the dural thickening, venous distension. And actually, what we have here is a very large ventral dural defect. And that what we could see across here was you see this little area of shading, and this is a, basically a jet from the CSF pulsation across that defect. And we, here's another example. This was at T1, T2. You can see that there's an area of indiscriminate CSF signal, and that's a flow signal that is occurring across the defect because that's where there is turbulent flow. And that was confirmed at, at myelography to be at the T1, T2 level. So sometimes you can see dural defects and sometimes you can see clues. But as Dan said, the main role of spine MRI really is to look at is there epidural fluid or isn't there? And he talked a little bit about this. I look for is there epidural fluid? Where is it? Because where is it helps me decide what kind of leak the patient has. And the reason that is important is because it has critical implications for the type of myelography I'm going to choose and also how I'm going to position the patient. So let's get this clear. When we see epidural fluid, we know the patient has a dural tear of some kind. Where that epidural fluid is located gives me a clue to maybe where the tear is. So 
I think Dan also showed a similar picture to this, but when there is mainly fluid at the front, I'm thinking there's mainly going to be a ventral dural tear, probably as a result of a discal spur or a little bony spur. Sometimes you don't see the bony spur at all. In fact, often you don't on MRI. So you don't necessarily use that as a clue. And as Dan said, the extent of where the fluid is doesn't really help guide you much as to where the, the leak site is. If it's eccentric like this, Sometimes I think that this is a clue to that it may be a nerve root sleeve tear. And so I look for these unusual loculated collections of fluid within the neural foramina surrounding an exiting nerve root. Now, when the fluid is dorsal like this, it can be as the result of a nerve root sleeve tear or, or less often a dorsal dural defect that they're, they're rarer. But when you have often circumferential fluid, it, to be honest, it can be coming from anywhere. Even ventral tears in the acute setting, they can be very circumferential, but these can also be lateral leaks as well. And as Dan said, if there's no epidural fluid, then I look for diverticular because then I'm thinking, has the patient got a CSF venous fistula? And CSF venous fistulas occur in association with a diverticulum in the large majority of cases. But the size and the level of the diverticulum is irrelevant. You can't tell from the MR which one is leaking as yet or nobody else has, has, has found out a way to do this yet. And this information is most helpful in the context of patients with SIH who are brain MRI negative, because if they don't have any diverticular, then it makes the likelihood of finding a CVF at myelography much less. OK, so what is my approach to myelography? Well, firstly, the con contemporary myelographic practice for leak localization is predicated upon an understanding of the likely pathology. And, and Dan showed this picture before in a review that we published and having a tailored approach to this. So these three principal types of spinal CSF leak. When there is epidural fluid, we need a myelographic technique with a high temporal resolution to capture that egress of contrast. And that is usually, in, in my practice, we do dynamic myelography, ultra-fast dynamic myelography. You need that when there is, you know, a fast leak where there is where there's epidural fluid. But also the positioning of the patient is also crucial. And that, again, is dependent on knowing where the leak is most likely to be, which is where your MRI informs your choice. So, for example, if I see mainly ventral fluid, I'm thinking mainly of a ventral tear, I'm going to position the patient prone when I do the myelogram because I want it to be leaking out in that prone position. When the patient has maybe more lateral fluid or the fluid is eccentric, I'm thinking about a nerve root sleeve tear or a lateral leak, that's more likely. So we put the patient decubitus with the side where the most epidural fluid is. And when I'm thinking about that the patient has a CSF venous fistula, so this will be where they don't have epidural fluid on the MRI spine, then again, you have to position them with the decubitus positioning. And you have to examine both sides because you can't tell from the MRI which side a fistula is going to be on. They're slightly more common on the right side, but you have to look at both sides. So what are the different myelographic techniques that are available to us? Well, the main thing is we hear time and time again, or, you know, from, from various institutions, you just can't find these leaks with myelography. My, myelography has changed over the last 10 years. You can find leaks, but you have to choose the right myelographic technique for the suspected leak type. And to be honest, there's no role for this anymore. We still see these kinds of myelograms sent to us where the patient has had a lumbar puncture done in, the fluor in fluoro, they've injected contrast, and then they've done the CT scan 30 minutes later. In, in, from my point of view, there's no point in doing this. You, you're really, you, the contrast will have leaked into epidural fluid by the time the patient gets around to the CT scanner, you'll miss the point of the leak. And CSF venous fistulas are often very hard to detect this late on because the contrast density has reduced by the time you've got the patient to the scanner. So these are the kind of, um, there's, there's different techniques that are available now, and most of them can be divided into CT myelographic techniques and fluoroscopic myelographic techniques. I'm, I'm not really going to say much about MR myelography where with direct intrathecal injection of GAD. It, you can do it. It's an off-license technique, and we haven't found it particularly useful. It may have a role in the future. Uh, I, I think you should consider this maybe a, a, a third-line technique. Um, and really, what you choose depends on what your neuroradiologist is most comfortable. There's, there's no real direct evidence comparing these techniques, no one best method. The method that we'll choose will depend on what your neuroradiologist is comfortable with and what they have in their department. And the important thing here is to use a meticulous technique and be comfortable with that. 
So the two methods which I use most frequently are lateral decubitus CT myelography to look for CSF venous fistulas and ultrafast dynamic CT myelography to look for, for dural tears. So for example, this is, this is an example of one of my technicians. If a patient has a ventral dural tear, and I will suspect this because they have mainly ventral epidural fluid, I'll be putting them on a wedge because I want to get a craniocaudal slope to ensure that the contrast runs down. And then I'm going to be doing some runs up and down the spine. We're acquiring an acquisition whilst we are injecting contrast. And it has to be fast because the contrast is going to be egressing at that time. So we're gonna go up and down the scan whilst we give the contrast. For looking for CSF venous fistulas, we do a lumbar puncture again under CT guidance. We give a contrast, we split the dose uh, between both sides. And again, they're on their side, but again, they have to have a slight tilt because we want contrast to be going up, but we don't want it to be pooling too much in the head. We want to stick it in the thoracic spine because that's where most CSF venous fistulas are. So this is less time dependent. It's more density important. You've got to get a good layering of contrast along the spine, and but it's still a little bit time dependent. You don't want to be waiting a long time because the density will go down. And you do need to look at both sides. And we do this both sides in the same day. We found that we're, we're pretty successful at, at doing this. And we turn the patient with the needle in. We can do this pretty carefully now. So mostly I use CTM, but sometimes I use fluoroscopic methods because these give a really nice temporal resolution of imaging leaks. So one example is uh, something called digital subtraction myelography. And this is where we're essentially have the patient on an angiogram table. We've used digital subtraction to get rid of bone. We're injecting contrast and we're looking for the point of CSF leak. Now, here I've positioned the patient prone because I'm thinking about a ventral tear. And this is an example of one. I'll go into this example later. Here, the patient's on their side. This is when I'm thinking about a lateral fast leak or a CSF venous fistula. Again, you have to examine uh, both sides. Better to do it on different days because of the way that the subtraction works. You can also do these just under fluoros fluoroscopy. It doesn't get rid of the bone, but um, the um, groups in uh, Germany, Bern and Freiburg, have a lot of success with this. This is from uh, one of Ike Petroviat's papers. And this is where you can, you know, tilt and um, rotate the patient while the patient's on the table. And that can be really nice when you're looking for a leak in real time. So here's an example of a contrast column coming up and you can see the point of CSF egress as it goes into this uh, ventral uh, dural tear right here. And you can see the contrast spreading along that. Okay, so I want to now show you some example cases of, of how we've made this distinction and the different uh, um, methods we've chosen. So remember I told you when there's ventral fluid, I'm going to do mainly do a prone ultrafast dynamic CT myelography. So here is an example. You can see contrast layering along the front of the theca, and you can see the exact point at which it egresses from the um, dura, and this was the leak at T10, T11, and it produces this characteristic uh, point at which it exits is characteristic forked appearance when you look at it on the sagittal reformats. If you wait a minute or even longer, what will happen is contrast will fill that epidural fluid collection and it will obscure that exact point of leak. Here's another example. In this point, you can see the contrast column hasn't quite yet got to this, but you can see here there's a little tiny bony spicule, wasn't evident on MRI. And here, when the contrast has come up, you can see that there is a nice split in that column where that contrast is leaking out. This was a patient that came to our center, had been followed up for many years as a Chiari malformation. And actually, she was called a Chiari with a syrinx. And she'd come to us from another neuroscience center. They were going to do a foramen magnum decompression. And they asked my opinion on the case. And, and here's an example where it's not just tonsillar descent. Look at the midbrain. It is squashed against the pons. The pons is flattened. You can see that this is not, this is brainstem sag. It's not just tonsillar descent. But look at all the other findings. You can see she has venous distension, pituitary distension. And so she has this syrinx just because she's got disordered flow around the craniocervical junction. It's not a Chiari. And you can see here, hopefully I've made this clear. You can see here, she has this ventral epidural collection, which had been missed for years. And so we went on to perform an ultra fast dynamic myelography. You can see that it's mainly ventral fluid, though it is a bit eccentric. 
And here what you can see is you can see just this little hair of contrast, which is aggressing at the T11, T12 level. Now, I, di I didn't see this on the scanning table. I actually saw this later. And I'd done a final run and this run was done at around, I say I put delayed, it was done around a minute. And you can see how rapidly that uh, that epidural collection fills. So just to show you, you know, you've got to be fast with these kinds of leaks in order to see the point of leakage. Here's an example of a digital subtraction myelography. You can see the contrast coming up and you can see the exact point at which it's egressing in the spine, this was a leak at T4, T5. So these are really nice for showing temporal examples of, of CSF leak. So here, the point of dural tear, contrast exiting thick and contrast filling that ventral epidural fluid collection. Now, when we see more lateral fluid, I'm thinking about a lateral ultrafast dynamic CT myelogram. I put the patient in the lateral position and I again do these dynamic runs. Here's an example here where I was suspecting there was going to be a leak on the left side. And what you can see here on these consecutive passes shows this filling of this diverticulum, but then you start to see the epidural leakage and then the leakage which extends almost beyond the, um, uh, the, the pedicle as well. Here's another example of a right T10 nerve root sleeve tear. You can see here very eccentric fluid collection. Here you can see the epidural contrast leakage, and you can see this little contained collection, which was around this T10 nerve root sleeve. And just to show you that on some, on some of the earlier ones I did where I didn't do them lateral, you can still pick up these nerve root sleeve tears when you even put the patient prone. So this, the, the contrast is layering prone, but you can see that there's progressive accumulation of contrast within this right T11 a neural foramen indicating that this was the cited site of leakage. And you can see here this contained collection of epidural contrast, but it's particularly dense around that right T11 nerve root sleeve. Okay, now if I'm thinking there's no epidural fluid, I'm thinking about a CSF venous fistula. And in this case, I'm gonna perform a lateral CT myelogram most of the time. And this shows you your typical appearance of a CSF venous fistula. Okay, so we can see that there's layering here of contrast on the right side because the patient's lying on the right side. Here you see that it's filling this diverticulum and right in front of it, you see that there is this vein that starts to drain and then it goes and, and runs in a paraspinal location, heads off to drain to the azagus. Now that draining, that draining vein is not the fistula. That's just the draining vein. The fistula occurs around this diverticulum. Here's another example. This patient presented with chronic headaches. We see that layer cake calvarial hyperostosis Dan was talking about. This time, what you can see is that she has an, an abnormal network of veins around this diverticulum on the left at T5. And you can see there's all these irregular squiggles that fill with contrast. And then you see some drainage that drains into the internal epidural venous plexus here. It then traverses across this vertebral body as a transosseous vein and then drains on the right side, that, that transosseous vein. So remember, the fistula is around that never sleeve diverticulum or never sleeve most of the time. Uh, it's that the drainage pathways can vary. Here we have an example of a left T1 fistula. You can see that there's multiple draining veins. There's a draining vein that heads off in this um, in, in, into costa vertebral space. And this had several draining uh, venous networks. This is one where there was a fistula around the T7 level, but there's a main draining vein that goes down in that cost, costo uh, transverse groove and then drains to the next level below. So the drainage vein is actually at T8, but the original fistula is at T7, the level above. And you can see that there. Now, just to show you, fistulas can have lots of different variable appearances. Here you can see this myelogram has been done with the patient on the left side. You can see contrast dependent here. And what you can see is this diverticulum here. But then there are all these little irregular squiggles that are around this diverticulum. And these are all contrast filling these internal epidural plexus veins. So it doesn't really have any paraspinal drainage. This is all internal epidural plexus drainage. And just to show you, this was from one of the, you know, an earlier myelogram. This was a myelogram done by a colleague a while ago looking for CSF leak. At the time, we didn't know about this. But just to show you, look, you can actually see evidence of a fistula even when you haven't done this decubitus. You can see here there are all these little irregular squiggles that fill around this nerve root sleeve. 
and that is that uh, abnormal network of that CSF venous fistula. But so it's just to show you, you can sometimes see it on these cases, but if you're suspecting it, don't do it like this. Do it as a lateral acquisition because you're more likely to expose that nerve root. Here is an example of a digital subtraction myelography, just to show you an example of a CSF venous fistula on this. I think this is a really nice technique if you haven't found anything on CT myelography or you're suspicious and you're not sure about an area, your, your, your um, neuroradiologist can go on to do this. And this is the workhorse in some, you know, really high volume centers at Cedar sinai they do a lot of this, they're very experienced with this. I think this is great if you can get access to to um, general anesthetic because it does require the patient to, to stay quite still. But what we see here is towards the end of this run, you can see here's the diverticulum. You can see some irregular squiggles around this. And right at the end, you see this draining vein that starts to flicker and fill with contrast really right towards the end of this run. And it happens right at the end, you can see that draining vein. So that's the example contrast layering on the right side. You see the meshwork of these uh, radicular veins, and then you see a flickering draining vein. Okay, so I want to finish up with just talking about some pearls and pitfalls. So you may think, what do I offer in my institution? Do we offer CTM versus DSM? I mean, there's no right technique, as I, as I told you. It comes down to personal preference and experience. I like CT myelography because I can get a better coverage of the spine. Digital subtraction myelography is limited to the size of the detector. Uh, CT myelography, you can often also see indirect signs. So when you see this, which is here's the kidney, here's the renal pelvis. This is renal contrast excretion. You don't see this in myelograms done for patients without leak until at least two hours after the examination. If you see it before then, in this case, it was immediate, you know that there's gonna be a CSF leak, most likely a CSF venous fistula. So if you haven't spotted it or your neuroradiologist hasn't spotted it, but you've seen this, keep looking or maybe go back and repeat. I also like CTM because certainly in my hands, DSM, we can't get a general anesthetic easily. We really have to book anesthetists a long time in advance. And we therefore have to do this under a local anesthetic. And unless you get the patient sedation, it's, it's often prone to movement artifacts. You have, they have to do a breath hold. The breath hold can be long. You saw that example of how the fistula flickers only towards the end. Well, if that happens, you know, the patient may be not able to hold their breath for that long, but it can be useful in the right hands and in the right setting. I also like CTM because it allows you to treatment plan. So we treat a lot of our uh, leaks with fibrin glue, CT guided fibrin glue. So it allows me to get an immediate same day planning. We do the injection the same day as we do the, the diagnostic test. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I, I prefer it to, for some things, but I do use DSM occasionally. I'll use it if it's for problem solving, if I'm not sure whether what I'm seeing is a fistula. When patients come to us and they've had lots of CT myelograms elsewhere, I really think about how I'm going to lower the radiation dose because CT myelogram is a big radiation dose. There's no way of getting around that. So sometimes I'll think, okay, a digital subtraction myelography or a fluoro might be a better a better test, but it really, really requires you to get your technique right. Make sure you have access to your suites. Again, that can be local resources. Often our INR suites are busy with thrombectomy and, and other uh, acute vascular cases, so it can be difficult. What happens when your myelography is negative, but you know the patient has a leak? Well, this is where I think, could the leak be below the level of your lumbar puncture? Have you done a good myelogram at all? For example, we know that these CSF venous fistulas occur laterally. Have you got good filling of the diverticular? This is a bad example, right? There's, there's contrast layering more anteriorly. You want it laying more laterally. Sometimes the patients are quite rotated. You know, I might bring them back, do it again, try and get better layering. And I'll look for the clues like renal excretion, but I know that's there. You've got to Lalani, please yep. unplug and replug your microphone. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's a bit temperamental, this headset. Um, so if, if you uh, see renal excretion and you know the patient has SIH, keep looking. If you've had unsuccessful myelography, but you know the patient has a leak, do something different. So this patient came to us. She'd had three unsuccessful CT myelograms at an external institution. Now, this patient was young. She was only nearly 40. She'd had nearly 24 passes of her spine. That's a huge radiation dose. So for me, I'm thinking, what am I going to do that's different? How am I going to find this leak? This patient, you can see, she has a big epidural fluid collection. You can see here, big ventral, 
collection, almost no dorsal fluid. I know she has a ventral tear somewhere. Now, when I look back at some of the external institution myelograms, what I can see here, you can see there's contrast here, but you can see the cord here. And then it looks like there's a filling defect. Now, this filling defect extended for some time, extended from about the C5 level to T5. That is suspicious to me. Is the cord tethered to the front of a defect? Has there been membrane formation? I mean, I'm sure Jürgen talked a lot about the membranes. So I'm thinking, how are we going to get this patient to leak? Because this contrast is not layering across here. And clearly, this patient's going to have a ventral tear. So I was thinking, firstly, the first thing I want to do is I, I, I did another MR. Could I get any clues? MR didn't give any clues. It just shows me the cord is tethered to the defect. And then I thought, OK, well, I think this patient is probably plugging her defect or there's some adhesions or membranes here. I'm going to get her to Valsalva on the table. Tried all of this, tried Valsalva with a syringe, didn't work. And then I got her to do a really, really big Valsalva with strain. And also the technique is really important. So what we did was we got them to really narrow down the field of view. And what you see again here is this filling defect. But I hope you can appreciate from this. It's very subtle. But what you can see here is that, that just to the right of the midline, you see there's a little streak of contrast which comes out like this. See this here? And the only reason we were able to pick this up is because we did something different. We narrowed our field of view. We made sure that we did recons right from the scanner. And she was found to have this leak at T1, T2. And when we look back at the original myelograms, you can actually even see this tiny little egress of contrast on this case. You can see here. There's just a little spurt. It goes out there. It's easy to find once you know it in retrospect. So do something different. Don't just do the same thing again. Important, don't give up on these patients. Myelograms can be negative when there's a leak. It doesn't mean that the leak can't be found. Might need to do something different. Your neuroradiologist just may need to try a different technique. Once you've found the site of the leak, it's possible to treat some of them within 20, 30 minutes. If you're using a fibrin glue technique, um, giving patients the same day diagnostic and treatment service. And David's going to talk about that more in his talk. And finally, um, my uh, friend Andy Callan in Colorado has been using this, which I think is a really neat technique, is when you find the leak, you can place at the same time a little golden nugget. So your surgeons don't have to count levels for ages when they're doing their pre-op planning. If they need to go in, they can just use this as their marker. So we are going to start placing these now for our, our leaks. And we find these really useful. It's like the, the surgeons are now digging for, for buried treasure when they go in to uh, seal the leak. So finally, remember MRI spine is not intended to pinpoint the leak, although occasionally it can do that. The choice of myelography is dictated primarily by the presence of epidural fluid or not. And remember, there's no gold standard for it. The best method is one that works for your neuroradiologist and your department. And just remember to have a good technique and trust your neuroradiologist. This is my team. I'm very grateful to them. Thanks very much. I take any questions now. Melanie, perfect. Wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. You really, you clearly have shown us that finding the leak is, is, is hard work and it's an art. So beautiful images and sometimes it's really a lot of work to do. I will start with some questions. I mean, um, MRI is such a beautiful technique. Why don't you just manage to show us the leak with MRI? <laughs> Fluids, uh, rapid fluids, I don't know, signals in T2 or super weighted T2 or whatever you call the sequences. Yeah. Just, just the leak with, uh, with an MRI. Is this possible at the moment? Will it be possible? I think, I think that is what we should be aiming towards in the future, right? With the, eventually, we want to try and get to a stage where we don't have to have invasive diag diagnosis for the patient. That's, that's the ideal. But at the moment, you know, even though we can have these clues and it's all very easy in retrospect, I showed you these images of the flow voids and the dural defects. But when you're maybe asking a surgeon to go in and operate at that level, just based on that info, it's it's really a lot of risk if you're wrong, because MRI is still very artifact prone and you have to be, you know, really secure in your sequences. And I think it's all very easy when I show you these dural defects and these flow signals, because I've got the corresponding myelograms, right? I can be suspect about something, and then I confirm it in a myelo, and then I show it to you in a talk, right? Because I think oh, it's obvious in retrospect. I think we just need, we need more case series and experience and refining of these techniques to make them um, better so that we we can do that. Obviously, you know, I know your, your group is doing a lot of work with um, 
you know, flow studies. The idea is hopefully that we should be able to maybe more accurately in the future use flow sequences to help us not only make the diagnosis of SIH, which we know is abnormal in, in uh, these flow studies often show us abnormal uh, cord motion, as you've nicely shown, but also maybe in pinpointing where a leak might be coming from. But Lelani, please let me underscore this. At the moment, we are not we are not able to tell the location of the leak with MRI. This is no. what we're aiming yes. at. So this is why we need all the sophisticated studies. Yes. Um, there is one one uh, comment from Nikolai Tonchev. First, the comment. This is, was really a good presentation. We appreciate it very much. And then a question follows. Does it change the therapeutic decision making whether the leak is at B1 or B3, we are going to treat the same way, no? Is, is, is B, is, sorry, does what it, does it, is what, it what, important to, to really know where exactly the leak is at B1 or B3 because don't we treat the patients the same way? It, when, when, uh, Jürgen, can I just understand, when you, when you, when they say B, do they mean like thoracic level T1 or T3? Is that what they're talking about? Oh, sorry, yeah, it's, it's, um, yes. um, it's T, it's T. Yes, exactly. T, right, okay. Yes, absolutely, because if, if you're, a, right, I mean, Jürgen, you'll be able to say more about this, but if you are doing a, a, um, a surgical exploration, are you going to do a multi-level exploration? I mean, that's going to increase your, your morbidity and for the patient right you want to be able to be as minimally invasive as possible and you want to be reducing that risk for the patient so so never, yes never yeah never ever explore the patient over, over several levels never ever yes we as neurosurgeons we have to trust our neuroradiologists and you the neuroradiologists have to really pinpoint the very exact location of the leak otherwise we will fail of course probably for the first approach giving a um uh, untargeted lumbar blood pitch, it's not of importance where the leak is in the first time. But once you start with all these invasive, those intense uh, imaging studies, then you need to be sure where it is, period. You need to be sure where it is. Yeah. Is Lalani, is, is dose an issue? I mean, repeating all these uh, myelograms yeah. Yeah. and then I... left side, right side, do you, is, is this an issue? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I think it is, right? I mean, these these CT myelograms are not, they're not small dose examinations. However, you know, ultimately the radiation dose you give the patient, it's, it's all a risk benefit analysis, right? Uh, ultimately, as long as you've told the patient, this is going to be a high radiation dose examination. And, and certainly if you're doing multiple runs of the spine, it can be high dose, but you've you've got to, we do as what is reasonably achievable to reduce dose. So as I told you, I look on my MRI for clues. When I have epidural fluid, I certainly don't go above or below the extents of that epidural fluid because it's not going to be there. The leak is going to be somewhere where that epidural fluid is. So I, I minimize my radiation field as much as possible. Your neuroradiologists are responsible for keeping the dose as low as is feasibly possible to achieve the diagnosis. In some patients who are suffering, particularly in patients who have, you know, basically ruined lives because they've got persistent headache or they've got brain sag dementia, particularly in those patients, you know, sometimes you have to repeat the myelogram and sometimes you have to repeat it again and again until you you get to, you know, finding this. But there is, you know, there has to be sometimes a limit, particularly in younger patients as to where you stop with this. And that's why that case I showed you at the end, I was I was. Honestly, I was a bit nervous to do more because she's already had 24 runs of the spine. That's a significant radiation dose. So if I then think I'm going to do something, it has to be something different to what's been done before. It has to be limited to really where I think the leak is coming from. And, and, and you know, I even thought, shall I do a DSM in this patient? Because I know that's going to do radiation. But I also suspected, I just thought this patient's going to be leaking in the high thoracic spine. And that is not a good place for DSM. Personally, I would always prefer to do an ultra-fast CTM there. But then in that patient, I also reduced the number of runs. So when this technique first came out, it was described as six runs. I never do six runs. I do mainly three to four runs. Sometimes I even stop it before. So we always look on the scanner, we inject the contrast, then we run out of the scanner as soon as possible. When we see the leak, we stop the scan. Perfect. May I ask you three um, a question that is bothering me all, all of the time post-treatment? So you now presented a very nice and elegant 
diagnostic algorithm and, and, and diagnostic plan. After treatment, let's say after surgery, not all patients do, do, do well in the first weeks or even month. Do you have a post-surgical diagnostic plan? How to approach these patients? What kind of imaging would you recommend? Yeah, and I think, I think um, and certainly for us, this has evolved, right? When we first started doing this, you know, the patients would feel better. And then we just, we didn't really standardly used to do follow-up. Uh, now, obviously, we're much more rigorous about this now. All, all the patients get imaging follow-up. And I think the timing of when you do imaging follow-up is contentious. Nobody really knows for sure. I mean, I guess we're trying to do imaging follow-up now, post a treatment, four to six weeks post-treatment. I think, um, and, and, and certainly that involves definitely MRI scanning of the brain. However, I just want to just say that sometimes this may not always help you because as Dan showed, you can get normalization of the imaging findings naturally with the course of the disease. And sometimes even if you've done a treatment which has sort of slowed down maybe a leak, but maybe not completely sealed it. And, and then you have to sort of listen to your patients and, and really see what's going on with the patient. It may mean that you need to do a repeat myelogram. And that can be difficult sometimes because, you know, sometimes CSF venous fistulas don't always leak when you do the myelogram. We've definitely had at least a couple of patients where we've done a great myelogram. You haven't seen the CSF venous fistula. You do everything the same and then it shows. Sometimes that's just the nature of the beast. So these things are difficult and there's questions I'm sure that are going to be answered around this in the coming years as we do more research around this. When do you when do you do your follow up? Um, three months. So we, 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 we ask our patients 14 days post-treatment and uh, send them emails six weeks after treatment and three months, usually there's a follow-up imaging. Yeah. Okay. But I think we, we need to, to go on. I have one very interesting question from the audience I would like to present to you. Um, uh, a question about the etiology, since most of the literature I find is about spontaneous fistula. Have you ever had a case of a patient with a chronic intracranial hypotension following a lumbar, a lumbar puncture in which no leak is apparent on several previous exams? I mean, this is a whole topic, isn't it? I mean, then we're, we're talking about postural puncture headache. And yes, there, there are loads of these patients out there. there. This is a very interesting condition. We don't honestly know what's going on in a lot of these patients. Jürgen's shown really nice cases of post you know, punk, post puncture blebs, you know, he's got a beautiful video. I don't know if you can share it, you know, of a, of a CSF oozing around yeah. these blebs, you know, and these are often poorly shown on standard imaging. They're often poorly shown on myelogram as well, you know, and um, often the I, patients have a very clear headache. Uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I would, if you, I must summarize this in one sentence, I would yeah. use what you said before, trust the patient and follow the patient and yeah. uh, adjust the examinations according to the patient. They are most often they are right. So, but wonderful discussion, Lani, is super cool, super good. Now we need to continue. And uh, I would like to introduce um, Dr. David Buttress, um, who is um, from Newcastle University Hospital and he will now um, enlighten us with image guided treatments. How can your neurologist help you um, with treatment? Uh, after everybody, uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm just going to try and switch off Lalani's talk. And yeah, Lalani, I think you need to switch off. You have to finish your your talk, and then David can share his screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see my garishly coloured screen uh, to talk about um, the image guided therapies for uh, spinal CSF leaks in SIH. Um, how can your neuroradiologist help you in, in the treatment of these cases? Um, so and then uh, following that, I've also got um, a few cases of how we can apply similar techniques to iatrogenic leaks uh, as well, if we've got any time left. Um, so see if I can get my slides working. Uh, so this is just um, uh, a, a diagram of the investigation and management pathway from a neuroradiological 
perspective of SIH, uh, which was published by Lalani and Co. Uh, fairly recently. Um, you could argue that it's already slightly out of date. I think it was written mostly in 20, uh, 2020, published in 2021, and by the end of 2021, there were already new radiological techniques for management of uh, spinal CSF leaks coming out. Um, so I think Dan has mentioned uh, the, the, the diagnosis of the condition and the diagnostic and clinical features. Lanley's talked about the uh, myelography and the localization of the leak. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, therapeutic aspects uh, from the radiological point of view. So epidural blood patching, uh, which is often done as a, a first instance treatment, which may be um, radiologically guided or more commonly unguided by anaesthetists, certainly in our center, I guess um, availability of that service will vary. Um, and then mostly I'm going to be talking about uh, fibrin glue patching under CT guidance. Uh, and then I will mention a bit of transvenous embolization, uh, a more recent uh, neuroradiological therapy specifically for CSF venous fistulae um, that has been described uh, over just the last couple of years. Uh, so epidural blood patch, um, this is often not radiologically guided, it's often done blind by anaesthetists using the patient's autologous blood. Um, large volumes are better, uh, so it seems that you know, 20 mils, which uh, was previously considered kind of the standard dose, would now be considered really the, the minimal dose uh, for an epidural blood patch for a spontaneous leak. Uh, it goes into the lumbar dorsal epidural space, uh, largely because uh, lumbar is safest, well, well below the, uh, the uh, spinal cord at this level, and there's a nice uh, fatty epidural space easy access for the anaesthetist to get their two needles in. Um, and we find that when we've looked at our data in our centre, it's fairly useful. It seems to help patients uh, get significant relief in about 50% of cases. So it's, it's uh, still worth doing, uh, despite all the other tests uh, and therapies that are now available, um, as well as being potentially a decent treatment. Uh, it's also quite a good uh, diagnostic test, potentially, uh, if there's clinical or radiological um, uh, concern that we're, we're barking up the wrong tree. Because if you replace a lot of volume by doing an epidural blood patch, uh, it can displace CSF into a more appropriate location and relieve symptoms. So if you get a good clinical response to an epidural blood patch, even if transient, that can be another suggestion that patients genuinely have got an SIH syndrome. Um, the other thing that it comes in very useful for is, as Dan and Lalani have said, when patients come in uh, acutely, they often have uh, very extensive spinal uh, epidural collections. They can be uh, circumferential and cover the whole spine. And then if you're trying to localize that leak um, using a myelogram, then you really have to cover the entirety of the spine uh, to try and work out where the leak's coming from. Whereas what often happens is after a, an epidural blood patch, there will be adhesions formed uh, within the epidural space, and it will actually um, partly tamponade or partly localize uh, the CSF leak. So you know, it may collect into the, the ventral thoracic spine if it's a ventral thoracic leak. So we can then, when we're doing our myelogram, do, a, do smaller coverage and reduce the dose and improve our field of view and our likelihood of uh, being able to identify exactly where uh, the leak is coming from. So epidural blood patch, not strictly speaking, uh, a neuroradiologically guided uh, procedure, certainly in our centre, but very useful nonetheless. Most of uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the use of fibrin glue. Uh, this will probably be... Um, you know, pretty familiar to, to many surgeons out there who've done some spinal work in their training or in their normal practice. Um, you know, this is a, you know, a sort of concentrated clotting factors with some uh, fibrin and thrombinogen in a double-barreled syringe. Uh, 
Uh, it's often used if you're doing an open procedure and there's a, a bit of a dural tear and a CSF leak, you can just spray it onto the defect and hope it, it seals the, the leak. Um, most of my spinal colleagues uh, are not terribly impressed with how effective it is and usually a bit skeptical uh, when I suggest that it may be useful to, to inject it um, under, under CT guidance, although more and more they're, they're coming to realize that it can actually be quite useful. Um, it is not licensed for use in that way. Um, so your radiologist will probably have to go through a procedure to uh, create local guidelines and, and get a, a, a local agreement from your hospital to use it in that way, or you may just have to consent patients uh, for the use of it as an, an off-licensed uh, use. Um, we typically use Tisseal. Uh, other formulations are available. Some people prefer one called Artis, which is the same thing, but has a slightly lower fibrin concentration. So it's a bit more liquid and slower setting. Um, I can't really see any, any great benefits of that. I think, as we'll see, we want this to, to form a nice blob of glue around the area of, uh, of the leak. And having a more liquid uh, preparation that tends to uh, flow away from the area that we're interested in is probably not great. So TCL is, is what most radiologists uh, tend to use. The mechanism of action is not entirely clear, to be honest. Um, you know, we know how it works from a chemical point of view, uh, forming uh, fibrin at the, the site of action, uh, but whether that is truly adhesive to, to the dura at the site of the leak, or whether it incites a slightly inflammatory reaction, or whether it simply stops the, the flow of CSF across the leak, allowing for healing to happen, whether it's a case in fistulae of extrinsic compression, or whether it's blocking uh, the veins internally, probably a combination of all of the above. Um, we're not entirely sure. So what do we actually do? Um, most neuroradiologists, most radiologists are pretty well versed in using image guidance to stick needles into patients. And the technique for treating uh, CSF leak is, is no different from that point of view. Um, most people use CT guidance to do it. Uh, occasionally people dis uh, have described using uh, digital subtraction myelography or uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, to perform it, although um, you, you probably lose a bit of the uh, detail of the nice axial images that you get using CT uh, if you do it under fluoro. Um, so the first thing you need to do, as described uh, ably by my colleagues, is confirm where the site of the leak is. Uh, and then we need to see if we can get the, the needle to the site of the leak. And we can do that on uh, the myelography CT. Uh, once the needle is in position, we confirm uh, that the needle tip is not uh, within the theca. We don't really want to inject all our glue intrathecally if we can help it. Um, so we can either use a bit of air, as in this case, to give negative contrast and see this uh, black area is air extrathecally. Or we can inject a little bit of uh, omnipate contrast uh, to confirm again that this is sitting outside the theca, um, but in the foramen where the leak is. Typically, we will then inject a bit of local anesthesia uh, because when you're putting in somewhere between two and six mils of fibrin glue into a relatively constrained space around a spinal nerve, typically, it can be quite uncomfortable for the patient. Um, we normally do these with the patient awake, uh, not GA, not sedation, They've often just had a myelogram. So they've been on the, the CT table for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, so you want to keep them fairly comfortable. Uh, patients generally tolerate this procedure extremely well. Uh, we just use a bit of local anesthesia to the skin, position the needle, put a bit of local anesthetic around the nerve root, and then inject somewhere between two to maybe up to six mils of uh, fibrin glue. Uh, around the site of the leak, uh, having a pacified the fibrin glue with a little bit of contrast so we can see where it's gone uh, on a, a follow-up CT. Uh, occasionally, we can 
use a, a bit of autologous blood before or after, uh, particularly if we're doing a, a ventral leak and we've got a large uh, epidural fluid collection that we want to displace some of the CSF away and just um, put something that's uh, a bit adhesive within that collection to try and um, obliterate a large uh, epidural collection, as well as putting a bit of fibrin glue just adjacent to where we know the leak site is. So just a couple of cases. This is the, the first case I ever used fibrin glue on back in about 2013. This was a young female patient who presented acutely uh, with all the clinical and radiological features of SIH. And on myelogram, we can see she had a, a lateral nerve root sleeve leak uh, in the thoracic spine. And this is following uh, putting a, a, a glue patch into the foramen. So this is about four mils of glue opacified with a small amount of omnipaque uh, radiological contrast. We can see it filling the foramen, obliterating that uh, pseudo meningocele that we had within the foramen. There's also moderate amount of mass effect uh, on the theca, as we can see, and that's not uncommon to see, and it is generally tolerated extremely well by patients. They sometimes have a bit of local pain or radicular pain, uh, which is why most people now treat with a bit of long-acting local anesthesia at the time of injection. But I don't think there have been any cases described where people have got a significant uh, spinal cord compression syndrome following uh, a glue leakage. Someone's probably going to tell me otherwise, but I think that would be an extremely rare complication. Uh, patients tolerate this extremely well. And this patient is now 10 years post-treatment and remains asymptomatic. So uh, foraminal leaks generally fairly easy to get to. Uh, ventral leaks can be more tricky. What we have to do is get the needle tip uh, far enough anteriorly that when we inject our glue and it travels ventrally, covers the midline and doesn't all squirt back out of the frame and down the area of least resistance. So if we're lucky, we can do that just with uh, through one side. If then we inject a bit of air or contrast and we can see it going across the midline, then we're happy. If we can only get a slightly more lateral position, and when we inject a bit of contrast, it doesn't cross the midline. We may have to put a needle in through the opposite frame and, and do the same on that side to make sure we've got coverage across the midline, as most of these ventral leaks are fairly close to the midline. And so following that, then we've got some opacified glue, again, crossing the midline ventral uh, to the theca, as in this case here. Uh, how well do they work? Well, there isn't a whole lot of uh, quality data out there, unfortunately. Um, what data there is, uh, both anecdotal and published sort of case series, is that it it's, seems to be pretty good. Um, as I say, we've certainly got cases um, that 10 years down the line uh, remain asymptomatic, even though the fibrin glue is only going to be in situ for you know, a few weeks maximum. Um, it's certainly a very quick, easy and well-tolerated procedure to do. As Lalani said, we can quite often get the patient in, do a myelogram, work out where the leak's coming from and put some fibre and glue adjacent to that leak and hopefully treat them in one sitting. Um, this can be done as a day case. Occasionally we keep people in overnight. Um, uh, depending on um, you know, availability of beds. Occasionally people get a, a rebound headache or rebound hypertension kind of syndrome. Um, if you do seal a leak effectively due to recalibration of CSF pressure, you know, once they've stopped leaking CSF in an uncontrolled fashion, they're still producing CSF and the changes in pressure can give them you know, the sort of opposite uh, headache, a more typical high pressure sounding headache. Uh, worse when they lie down, better when they stand up. We've occasionally had patients with visual change from papilledema. Um, and occasionally we treat patients with acetazolamide to try and reduce CSF production. 
it's usually uh, a, a temporary thing. It often lasts for a few days to you know, maybe a week to 10 days and then settles down. Um, typically not a, not a significant problem. Um, there does seem to be some suggestion that patients who present acutely, um, or at least who are diagnosed and uh, treated acutely, uh, treatment is more successful in those cases than in cases who have had um, CSF leaks for years. Although just because a patient uh, is a chronic case, they should certainly be investigated. And this is still a reasonable treatment in the first instance. Um, it doesn't always last permanently. So we quite often have patients who do very well for a few weeks or a few months, and then either spontaneously or they say, oh, well, I just sneezed or something like that. And then their symptoms recur. Um, usually it seems to be a recurrence of the original leak. So it's quite often worthwhile just repatching at that site rather than going back and doing a myelogram again. Um, but occasionally people seem to be prone to developing leaks and they do develop leaks at other sites. So occasionally we do have to reinvestigate and retreat people. Uh, CSF venous fistula is slightly more complicated and it's the kind of the aspect of CSF leakage that seems to be developing fastest at the moment, certainly from a neuroradiological point of view. Um, these are terrible images because this is the first uh, case I diagnosed um, nine years ago, maybe something like that. And what we've got on our myelogram is just a little dot of contrast, which looks very uh, unexciting on the axial and coronal reformats. But when we do a curved reformat, we can see this is actually a little a wiggly vein uh, opacified with contrast leaking out. And again, this is one that we treated with fibrin glue. We can see this is where our needles come into the foramen. We filled the foramen with glue. And what we can see here is a pacified glue extending into the vein. And so this successfully obliterated the fistula. And again, nine years later, she remains asymptomatic. Uh, as I said, it has, fistulae in particular, have really started powering the evolution of, of the various neuroradiological therapies, both in terms of um, glue patching, rather than just saying, oh, well, I think we can get a needle into the frame and, and stick some glue in. Um, now we tend to use larger caliber needles, with the 22 gauge spinal needles, which are everybody's go to, they tend to clog up the minute you stop actively injecting. So you can't reposition the needle or start injecting in different locations or start and stop your injection, depending on patient symptomatology. So now if you use an 18 gauge needle, then you can inject a bit, reposition the needle, inject a bit more, cover more areas of the, the frame and, or of the fistula. Um, you may use more than one needle to target different areas, uh, particularly if you've got an extensive venous drainage. Um, and then you can target those areas specifically. Uh, certainly with fistulas, there seems to be evidence that demonstrating glue in the draining vein is associated with a, a better chance of a, a permanent response uh, than just extrinsic compression with no glue in the vein. Uh, and also now recently described is uh, transvenous embolization of fistulae, so akin to treating uh, a brain AVM, um, putting a, uh, a vascular catheter in via usually the femoral artery, getting it all the way up through azagous vein into the segmental vein of the spine, uh, and then using one of the uh, intravascular glues uh, to try and block the fistula. Um, so we'll talk about that in a sec. This is just a, a few more cases of sort of more advanced glue patching of fistulae. So thanks to Lalani for letting me use these, these pictures. Here we can see this complex fistula with a pacified veins extending uh, within the frame and, and paraforaminal. We've got a needle coming in laterally into the frame and targeting where the fistula is arising from. And we can see post glue, we've got glue within the frame and, here. A further area of, of uh, venous drainage extending down into the intercostal space. So we've got a different needle coming in to, to target this venous drainage specifically. Uh, 
with glue extending here and also extending into the vein here so we can see that specific targeting of specific areas of the fistula. And again, we've got a large fistula here with a big segmental draining vein. Here, we've got a needle coming in, targeting the fistula site adjacent to this little bleb. And then we've got another slightly deeper uh, needle coming in to put glue adjacent to the large draining vein to compress that, to slow flow, to allow this area to totally compress this uh, fistula and uh, allow it to heal. So talking about the uh, transvenous route, uh, this is something that in, in Newcastle, I think we're slightly behind the curve. We've only recently um, got the go ahead to start doing this as a procedure and we haven't actually done any cases yet. Um, so this is something that the vascular interventional neuroradiologists will do. Um, it uses the intravascular liquid embolic agent. So this is not uh, fibrin glue. Uh, these are um, so-called glues that precipitate out of a, a solvent of DMSO, which is quite toxic. Uh, patients don't really like it, but we're using very small volumes. Uh, so they tend to tolerate it quite well. There's various sorts on the market and they all do more or less the same thing. It gives you this so-called uh, lava appearance where uh, the liquid will solidify uh, from the outside first. So you end up with a, a cast uh, of uh, solidified uh, embolic agent, which with a, a liquid core, which you can slowly squeeze and extend down the venous system towards the fistula uh, and into the fistula to obliterate it. Um, again, you have to know exactly where the fistula is. So this is a couple of cases uh, from the, the first paper that described this from the Mayo Clinic. So we've got clearly evidence of intracranial hypotension. We've got a digital subtraction myelogram showing a fistula. We can see the little wiggly veins coming off this little diverticulum here. And then we can see a catheter, which is going up the venous system down into the segmental vein. And we've got this liquid embolic extending along the segmental vein, going along a bit into the uh, subcostal vein. and we see some tiny little wiggly veins in here and then obliterating the fistula from the venous side. And we've got normalization of the scan and normalization of the clinical syndrome. Another case similar, showing you the same thing, clear radiological features of SIH, a little fistula on the digital subtraction myelogram. And then following the glue, we've got a pacified glue within the venous system we can see in this network of veins around the foramen and normalization of the clinical and radiological abnormality following that. So because uh, treatment of CSF venous fistulae has, has been quite sexy recently, there's actually a bit more outcome data. People have been looking at it a bit more seriously. Um, so we've got data looking at fiber and glue treatment, as we've talked about as well as uh, fistula embolization transvenously. And actually, even though the transvenous embolization is a bit sexier, the, the results actually seem to be quite similar. Um, so various radiological and uh, neurological headache scores and clinical scores have been used to look at it. Uh, and fundamentally, they appear fairly similar. So one of them saying patients are much improved or very much improved for both methods of treatment of venous fistulae. Uh, they had symptomatically improved or very much improved in somewhere in the 80s percent. So significant improvements there. Um, the, the main difference between the two is that the fibrin glues tended to be more likely to require repeated treatment. Um, so that's something that is pretty easy to do with a, a fibrin injection not very easy to do uh, with a, a transvenous embolization. So pros and cons of, these, uh, of this technique, particularly fibrin gluing, well, it's very simple, straightforward. You know, pretty much any neuroradiologist will be able to learn this technique. Um, it can be done the same day as the myelogram in many cases, um, usually as a day case or a short stay for the patient.
Uh, it's relatively cheap. It's pretty low risk. Patients tolerate it very well. Uh, if it doesn't work or if it works and then the patient's uh, symptoms return, it's something that's easy to repeat. Um, and it's something that once it's done, you know, your glue is reabsorbed in four to six weeks, probably. There's, there's no reason that even if it doesn't work, then you can't then proceed on to surgery or venous embolization if it's a fistula. Um, downside, you know, occasionally you get patients that are very difficult to treat through this technique just because uh, their body habitus or if they've got uh, scoliosis or lots of metal work involved and it's just a technical challenge. Um, so that's the main issue really. Uh, again, they may require repeat treatment. Um, they may be more likely to require repeat treatment than, uh, than with other techniques, surgery or transvenous fistula embolization. Uh, and we still don't have a whole lot of long-term outcome data with this, although that is probably true for pretty much all the treatments for these cases, as you know, most of the treatments are fairly recently described. And if we've got a final five minutes, which I don't think we really have because we've uh, probably run over massively. I've got a couple of cases where you just applied the same technique to some iatrogenic CSF leaks as well. So this is just more in the vein of can your neuroradiologist help you? So again, we've got a patient who had a neurofibroma in the cervical spine, had that taken out, but they were left with a bit of a CSF leak. Uh, Obviously, we don't need to do a myelogram in this case. Uh, we know where the leak is. What we need to do is get the glue uh, into the site of the leak. So we've popped our needle down uh, into that expanded foramen and put a couple of mils of glue in. Uh, again, pacified with a little bit of um, Omnipake, and we can see it filling the foramen and extending slightly back into that uh, pseudo meningocele that the patient had. We don't really want to just try and fill the entire pseudo meningocele. We want to target the actual site of the leak and then we can uh, seal the leak with the glue and uh, the patient's uh, pseudo meningocele can be drained. Again, radiologically, you can just withdraw the needle a bit, drain the uh, pseudo meningocele on the way out and it uh, fortuitously didn't recur in this case. Um, this is a, an, another case with a, a patient who had a large calcified disc right here, taken out. But unfortunately, following surgery, they ended up uh, with a, a persistent leak. Um, so quite a lot of the CSF volume ended up in the pleural space. The patient had all the clinical and radiological signs uh, that have been discussed of CSF leakage. So rather than having another operation to try and get in there and repair it, uh, we just popped a needle in and put a slightly larger than usual volume of fibrin glue uh, into the cavity and follow up uh, a month or so later, we can see there was clinical improvement and we can see the radiological improvement uh, with you know, basically normal post-surgical appearances now, no ongoing leak. Uh, this one was a bit trickier from a radiological point of view. So this was a young lad who had um, scoliosis surgery and following that ended up with um, a sort of low pressure syndrome. You can see you're not going to get great imaging of any sort with that metal work in there. Uh, but we can see some of the features of his low pressure, even on his spinal scan. We can see this very dilated uh, transverse sinus that we've got up there. There's a suggestion here that you can see this double line, which is actually uh, the dura being elevated by the CSF epidural collection anteriorly. Again, we didn't want to uh, overly irradiate this young lad who was only about 14. So we just had a chat with the surgeon who said, well, I'm pretty sure I know where the leak will be. Um, it's where I did one of the osteotomies. I think I might've gone a bit deep. So we just targeted uh, that level and put a reasonable volume of glue uh, into the dorsal epidural space. And we can see this is the site of the leak. And there's a little bit of glue just depending uh, into the uh, theca. He didn't have uh, any problems related to that, uh, but his CSF leak uh, 
did resolve and he, he's back doing normal 14 year old boy stuff now. Um, this is one of the few cases where we did have to do a myelogram. So this was a patient who'd had uh, surgery for uh, synovial cyst and neural compression, uh, but then he got repeated cord requina compression uh, secondary to fluid collection in the surgical site. Uh, so he ended up having five redo ops. Um, every time they did maneuvers to see if they could see if it was a CSF leak or not, or was this just the most rapidly growing seroma that anyone had ever seen? In the end, people were pretty convinced it must be a CSF leak. So we did a myelogram and did demonstrate a little tiny leak. So we put some glue in and again, he was uh, asymptomatic from you know, 24 hours after treatment and went home thereafter. Uh, finally, you know, these, these are all the same sort of cases. So hemangioparasitoma taken out, uh, patient represented with cord compression, which turned out secondary to uh, a large subcutaneous and epidural CSF collection. Um, have a chat with the surgeon who says, oh, well, actually, I did take a bit of dura out uh, from within the foramen, uh, which is where the tumor was arising. And I thought I'd repaired it, but obviously my repair you know, wasn't complete. So we managed to get a needle down into the frame and we didn't want to try and fill this entire uh, pseudo meningocele with glue. But once we knew where the leak was coming from, we could just fill that uh, T5 frame and with glue. See, there's a little bit extending over the posterior aspect of the theca and again, sealed the leak and the patient was asymptomatic and didn't require further surgery to try and uh, uh, seal that leak. So takeaways, um, transcutaneous management of CSF leaks, uh, particularly spinal uh, uh, spontaneous CSF leaks uh, seems to be pretty effective. Uh, it is certainly pretty quick, easy, and very well tolerated by patients. Um, it may well avoid more invasive treatments doing, this, doing it this way. And what it certainly doesn't do is present you, uh, prevent you from going on to a more invasive treatment if it doesn't work. So it's probably going to be uh, a good idea to start off there. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to uh, both my colleagues who are far better educators than I am, which is why I've nicked loads of their images and, and slides to use in this talk. So thanks to Dan and Lau and uh, Professor Beck, of course. Uh, that's everything. David, thanks for your fantastic talk. And it was really impressive, especially also for the huge iatrogenic leaks, how you cut them off with just a single patch. Uh, very impressive. Thanks for your, for your beautiful talk. Um, I might start with a question from the audience, which is probably really very relevant and very often asked. Can fibrin glue result in glued up intradural nerve, nervous fibers and hence cause reticular pain or chemical arachnoditis? Um, there are probably, probably yes. It can also... Uh, Please use your microphone again, then we can understand you way better. Yeah, sorry. Um, Thanks. That's one of the reasons that we will always try to make sure that our, our needle is uh, extra thecal in position. So we want to minimize the amount of intrathecal uh, fibrin glue. Um, it is probably a, a theoretical risk if you've got a reasonable volume of fibrin glue uh, intrathecally. Certainly, it's not something that we've ever seen in our practice. And I don't think there have been, to my knowledge, I'm not sure that there are any cases described. Um, I think you, you certainly don't want to you know, inject your full four or six mils of fibrin glue intrathecally. Um, you know, other potential risks uh, that we have not seen but remain potential risks are if you're doing repeated injections, people becoming sensitized to it and ending up with anaphylactoid or anaphylactic reactions. I think that has been described. Um, so there are these potentially very small but potentially severe risks um, 
that it's it's worth mentioning to patients, but it's certainly nothing that we see um, on a you know even on a, a rare basis. So I think as long as you are um, as long as your technique is appropriate, that should not be a significant risk. No. Okay, a clear answer. Then, um, do you recommend any specific post patch, post clue um, uh, procedures, or, or, or bed rest for how long, or refrain from sports or exercise? Do you have a, a certain plan how the patients should behave for the next hours, days, or weeks? Uh, yes, and uh, you know that's evolved slightly. Um, well, we tend to keep people in bed for an hour afterwards, pretty much when we've done anything to them. That's pretty much just routine. Even if we said, you know, get up and go crazy, I don't think the, the ward staff would let them. Um, so that there tends to be an hour's bed rest afterwards, uh, even if they haven't had sedation or GA. Uh, that's often just because they're feeling, you know, they may feel slightly sick if they've had a myelogram, a bit of uh, intrathecal contrast sometimes make people feel a bit unwell. Um, Uh, they sometimes have a little bit of local or radicular pain uh, following a gluing, uh, even if we have used some local anesthesia. Uh, so we normally keep them around for about an hour just to make sure they feel okay from that point of view. Um, from the point of view of how to ideally try and sort of keep the patch in place, keep it stuck, um, we will say for ideally six weeks following the procedure, Uh, to try and minimize uh, anything that is really going to either stress the, the patch by raising your uh, ICP, raising your CSF pressure. So you know, no straining, no lifting heavy things, ideally for six weeks, and to avoid doing anything that involves lots of um, flexion or twisting or you know, any sort of significant mobilization Uh, of the of the spine particularly the area of the spine that you've treated um, so we'll say look you know I, I know that everyone loves doing yoga and pilates but try and avoid doing that for six weeks following the patch I think once you've got up to about six weeks after that um, what's the, the effect that it's going to have will probably have happened and then the idea of treating these people is to try and get them back to a normal life um, so we say well If at six weeks you're still feeling great, then gradually get back to doing your, you know, whatever your your normal uh, activities are. Okay, six weeks, good. Then there is one question: um, Is the technique possible only for small pinholes, or also be for larger defects? I think you have probably shown that you can steal quite quite large defects but maybe you can comment on your own um yeah i think we can treat fairly large defects um there seems to be uh you know i've done i think three um plural fistulae following um mm -hmm. thoracic discectomies now over the last 10 years or so um, and the first one, I sort of put four mils of glue in because that's what I was comfortable with. And it worked for you know, a couple of days and then recurred. So I put another four mils and it worked for a couple of days and then recurred. And then the surgeon said, well, this is rubbish. I'll go and repair it. Um, and then the second time I thought, well, we need more volume. Uh, I was still a bit worried about putting 10 mils of glue in. That's quite a big blob, it felt like. So I put in 10 mils of autologous blood and followed it up with uh, some glue, uh, and that worked a bit better. Um, but it's quite a faff, so the next time I just went straight for 10 mils of glue, uh, filled the whole cavity, and that did the trick. So I think, you know, yes, you can treat larger leaks. Um, you have to be able, you probably need to use larger volumes, you know, if only just to cover the extent of the leak. Um, you probably need to titrate it slightly to the size of uh, the CSF collection so that there's not too much of a dilution effect. Um, so you may have to, if there's a large pseudomeningocele, aspirate that first to collapse it so that you can then put a, you know, a, a larger but still reasonable volume of glue in, say, you know, 10 mils rather than four mils or something like that. Okay, I think, thanks. I think also there is one... Just, hmm? Go so ahead. I was just going to add, add a comment on that, that... Um, um, 
irregardless of the size of the defect, probably what David is, uh, would probably echo is this is also the acuity. And I think you would probably agree with that too, Jürgen. You know, I think if you've got an acute leak, it's it's more, remember that, you know, fibrin is trying to just act as a, I guess, as a sort of crosshatch for, you to, for, for um, more natural sealant mechanisms to work. And that's why we're saying with more chronic leaks, you probably do really need to be inside the slurk if you're going to be in it. And even then, um, you know, I think it really does depend. You, you're probably more likely to be successful with acute leaks, regardless of the size of the defect. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, I think there's one comment uh, just to, to finish or to complete the questions from the audience. Um, Farouk um, gives a comment that Tissial may be used inside the dura and even inside the ventricle or during brain surgery. Um, this might be true, of course, and sometimes we use it in sinus surgery or in, in brain surgery, but still we are very humble and very careful not to, to use glue inside the dura in spinal surgery, not to fix the, the, the spinal cords to the dura. So um, in recent um, cases, I'm, I'm refraining from using glue and uh, just using using um, Tacho seal to, to sandwich patch. So of course we can use it and you've sh shown nice results, but we are not aware of long-term results. So do it, but be careful and document it and follow your patients, of course, as always. Then um, one more comment or one more question. Um, would you please comment, uh, this goes to me, would you please comment on how often do we need an exploration? How often do we need a surgery in uh, in my department. I have never seen one till now. In all suspected cases, we only we would do a blood patch. Do we have any statistics? We do have a kind of a statistics, but this is of course very biased by referral bias. So I think overall, looking at the literature, probably every fifth patient would need uh, a surgery. And in, in our department, I think half of the patients that come to, to my department need surgery, which is currently probably two to five cases a week that we close um, surgical. Then um, I think we went through all the, the questions on the, in the Q&A box. Would any one of you, this was just brilliant, and, and all the, or almost all participants still stick to our webinar, almost two hour webinar by now or uh, over two hours webinar. So congratulations for that. Would you like to make a final comment, Daniel? All good for you. Um, only to apologize for making it run as long as it did. I, I ran over a bit and I'm very sorry to everybody for that. This was perfect. Lalani, any comment? Uh, no, no, I think thanks so much for inviting us and thanks. Um, thanks. Um, thanks for hopefully, you know, Maybe some You need to unplug your microphone oh, oh, again. Oh, sorry. sorry. I've gone Dalit like again. Sorry. Um it's it to be honest, it's pretty intimidating to give this kind of talks in front of Jürgen, who has a lot more experience than we do. And so it's been really great to have him and his experience on this on this talk as well. And David. I'm not sure I have anything to add. Just uh, thanks for listening to everyone that has stayed with us. Thank you very much. So almost everybody um, uh, was present until until now. So I would like to thank you for this brilliant, fantastic uh, talks. And um, clearly, neuroradiology is key to this disease. Clearly, very, and you've you've proven this now. And we are very keen to see your your uh, brilliant expertise and more work of your of your. Um, the practices and even probably you can you can join or must join and uh, further this this really curious disease and all the techniques that we can help our patients and last but not least I need to uh, I would like to thank Mansur Mansur Farugi and the ENS CSF section it's um, it's super that the ENS CSF section invites three neurogeologists to present with this important topic. And unfortunately, Manso couldn't be with us. He uh, was still at the surgical theater helping patients. So thanks from on behalf of the ENS to all of you and to the audience for um, listening and have a nice evening. Bye-bye from Freiburg and thanks again to all of you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye from Cambridge. <laughs>
Have a good evening. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.